Welcome again, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on My Heritage Library Edition, Resources for Scholars of History, Area Studies, and Ethnic Studies. My name is Rob DePaulo. I'm the Director of Marketing here at EBSCO, and I'll be moderating our session today. I'd like to start off quickly by introducing our presenter for today, Ross Bloom. Ross is the B2B Account Manager and Business Development Analyst for MyHeritage, and has previously held many other marketing and project management roles within the company. And I'd like to take just a quick moment uh, before we begin our presentation to go over a few housekeeping items about our session today. This presentation is scheduled for one hour and we'll set aside the last few minutes of that time for a question and answer period. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation by entering them in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, what we'll do is we'll go through your questions and answer as many of them as time allows. Should we not have sufficient time at the end of the session to answer all questions, we will still respond to each of you directly within a day or two of our session um, with an answer to your question. So don't worry if we don't get, have time to get to it, we will make sure that your, your question is answered. The session is being recorded today, and the recording will be made available to you in the coming days. Please be advised that we have muted all audio lines to avoid feedback or interruption during the discussion, and we thank you in advance for keeping your line muted throughout the event. Finally, please use the chat box, not the Q&A box, if you have any technical or other questions during the session, and I will do my best to respond as quickly as possible. Um, and without further delay, I'd like to hand things over to Ross to get us started here. Ross? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Ross Bloom. I'm just going to share my screen here with you. Okay, can you see that? It's up, looks good, Russ, thank you. Great. Uh, so welcome to uh, our WebEx, uh, My Heritage Library Edition, Resources for Scholars of History, Area Studies, and Ethnic Studies. So uh, we wanted to um, discuss how this uh, unique resource, uh, which we'll talk about exactly what's in the, in the My Heritage Library Edition, can be applied to a lot of different academic uh, fields of inquiry. Uh, so we'll start with a brief overview, uh, and I'll do a demo of uh, the product itself just to show you how it works and some different ways you can use it for uh, d different sorts of uh, academic research. Uh, then I'll go into more of an explanation of the different types of record collections that we have, uh, give some tips for performing academic searches. Uh, and then finally, do an overview again of the features and open it up for questions and answers. Uh, and as Rob said, please feel free uh, as I'm talking to put questions in the uh, the chat box, and we will uh, get back to them at the end because I'm not able to see all the questions that come up uh, during the presentation, unfortunately. All right, so let's get started. Um, So this is uh, the home page of the My Heritage Library Edition. This is what people will get to when they open up the program uh, on, the on the library computer or using remote access uh, in their, uh, wherever they live or in their dorm room. Um, and you can see it has a few different ways to go about beginning your search. Uh, the first is just a basic search here with, uh, and you can see it's, it's actually built as you, you may think that this looks like a purely genealogical resource, um, but we're going to talk about some different things that you can do in terms of searching to help uh, get the value of all these incredible historical documents for a variety of different uses in the academic uh, sphere. So uh, this is the basic search, and we also have an, ac a, an advanced search, um, which just provides for people to put in a little more information. And this is one of the places where you can actually start to, to do some work um, to, to do more of an academic style search. Uh, down here at the bottom, we have search records by location. So for instance, if you're looking at a specific uh, state in the United States, if you're looking at Texas, all you have to do is click on Texas. And here we have essentially unique search page for all of our Texas collections. Um, that includes both these on the right, which are all listed, um, our specific Texas collections, as well as um, someone doing search in, for instance, the United States Census, 
which we have uh, the entire U.S. Census from 1790 through 1940, including the images and the index. Uh, so those would also be included if, if someone is, for instance, living in Texas uh, when they're recorded in the U.S. Census. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of um, basic searches. I'll also just point out here on the side, if someone is looking at a specific type of history, for instance, military history, uh, they can click here and get more information about what collections we have for uh, military, um, military subjects. Um, but I will start by doing a search uh, in one of our newest collections, which is uh, the Arizona Death Certificates. So one of the first things that uh, we like to say when we talk about doing historical research or academic research using this collection is that it's best to think about the uh, think about what kind of information you're trying to derive and then find a collection that may help you get there. So for instance, if I'm looking at uh, the history of uh, the tuberculosis uh, epidemic in the early 20th century in um, Arizona or in the American West in general, or for instance, uh, people who may have migrated from the Eastern United States to the West uh, for health reasons during that time, I can look at a, a collection like the uh, Arizona Death Certificate and uh, say, perhaps just taking it some basic uh, information, this would be just general information that we think of, you know, if we're looking at people who moved from eastern United States to the West. Uh, you know, someone, for instance, who may have passed away from tuberculosis might have had a short life, so we, we can think about um, interesting creative ways to do a search uh, and say, okay, if someone passed away in Arizona at the age of 30 and was born in New York, um, let's see what we can find about, about that person and how does that connect to my topic of interest. So here we have, as you can see, uh, a lot of options for, for results. If I click on this specific one, uh, you can see the result is shown at the top with some basic, uh, this is more, again, of the genealogical information about the person uh, indexed and uh, put in print on the top. But if you go into the actual document image, you're given a lot more information. And, you know, for instance, here uh, you're, you see the, the cause of death, which is listed as pulmonary tuber tuberculosis. Um, and in this case, uh, in this, in this uh, specific collection, the, the note taker of the death certificate was actually asked what, whether the disease was contracted in Arizona, and if not, where. So here you have evidence that this person probably uh, contracted tuberculosis in the east and may have moved uh, to Arizona uh, as part of a larger movement of people coming uh, to try to get uh, to get well from, from the disease, which is a known uh, phenomenon. But here, um, so if you're looking at this, you can see, okay, it's not just that this is a person that died from tuberculosis. Uh, you have a lot of other information, for instance, where they, their parents were from, uh, who was their informant. In this case, it looks like it was their wife. Um, what was the whole process by which they arrived in Arizona. This is, in, in this case, it's someone who moved to Arizona three years ago and moved to their current uh, place of residence two years previously. Um, and so you, you can see that there's a lot of really interesting information given both uh, about the person as well as about the, the surrounding uh, perhaps political environment. Uh, who was the person that registered the death? Um, what was the, the level of medical oversight in that uh, area. There's, there's really a great number of uh, different things that you can take from this one document. Um, and so, you know, in this case, we've, we've looked at it from an angle of perhaps health 
history of health and history of this illness, but you could also, by the same token, do a search on, for instance, a, a person, a uh, general search on someone with a, a certain ethnic last name um, to be able to see, okay, if there's a certain community in Arizona, what were what was happening in those communities? Were, were there certain health issues, perhaps, that were affecting people in those communities? Um, so you can see it takes a, a bit of, uh, of thought of how exactly can I get to the information that's of interest to me as a historical scholar, but uh, there is actually a lot of information. This is, this is a database with six billion historical records, so there really is a lot of wealth of information that is contained in, the, in these historical documents. It's just a matter of thinking about, as a researcher, what are the questions that I want to ask and what is there in uh, some of these different collections that would be of interest to me. So, and just uh, to talk a little bit about some of our, uh, uh, records of interest for people doing different sorts of area studies, regional studies, European studies. Um, if I go, just as we have these pages, uh, special search pages for United States, we also have uh, search pages for pretty much every country in the entire world. And on the right, you can see what historical document collections we have for that country. So in this case, Sweden, we have a variety of different types of collections, both index collections as well as uh, image collections. So Again, it would depend on what the person is looking for, uh, but I'll just do a basic search on a common first name, someone who was born in 1847. Uh, this can, here you get all the results, and there's a lot of information given in the results as well. So if there's someone, for instance, that's looking for uh, information about a specific county in Sweden, uh, they might be interested in this. They can also, of course, do a search, refine their search based on the county name. And you come into this document and you have uh, some really nice, it's a handwritten document. You can also look at how, how are these, uh, these are uh, household examination books, which is similar to a census. How are these records uh, being kept? What was what was important for these you note know, for the the Swedish uh, political establishment to take down about the people living in the country? Uh, how were families constructed? Uh, what was different uh, sociological or anthropological uh, phenomena happening within these communities? Um, so again, it's it's really a matter of the a researcher being able to to look at. Their, their research question from uh, perhaps a different angle. Uh, and these are, these are records that, especially for certain uh, populations, ethnic groups, uh, people who may not have had too much uh, written by them or about them in the, in the primary historical record, uh, the collections like the U.S. Census and things like uh, these Swedish church books or other types of documents from around the world, um, it, it's, quite, it's quite amazing the type of information you can find out about uh, certain communities based on uh, these, these types of records, which seem, of course, at, at the first glance as to be um, more of a genealogy record, but it really contains a lot of interesting uh, information about different historical processes as well. So now I'll talk more about the specific historical record collections that we have. Um, the database contains six billion historical records from diverse collections from all around the world, um, and that includes over one billion records that have been added in 2015 alone. So you can see that it's also a very fast-growing collection that's not stagnant by any means. Um, this, uh, this record collection includes the main offerings of the World Wide Records. Uh, collection which you may have uh, be, been familiar with, uh, plus many additional collections. And in my heritage, as opposed to many other 
uh, similar genealogical databases, which again have uh, usefulness for academic research as well. Uh, we have a special emphasis on, his, on international collections, which comes from our uh, identity as my heritage is actually was actually built as a genealogy service, which is offered around the world. It's available in 42 languages, so it's really um, become a, a global community of uh, genealogists and family history researchers who are contributing content. And because we have that global audience, we've always been more focused on finding a more global array of historical content. Uh, so this is just a sampling of some of our unique collections. Again, the Arizona S certificates, which I mentioned before, is a new collection of something that is only available in terms of the genealogy in the genealogy databases through MyHeritage. Likewise, uh, Arizona birth certificates also from the early 20th century, late 19th century, containing a really uh, great amount of information about people. You can look at immigration to Arizona through this document. You can look to uh, birth, uh, what, what was the uh, medical and social uh, environment surrounding birth during this time period. Um, another collection is South Carolina Deaths, um, which is an index collection, and it contains some information about uh, people who were uh, from South Carolina during the 19th century. Uh, 20th century. Uh, index of Texas, several Texas newspapers uh, from the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, My Heritage Family Trees, uh, which is, again, it's this is a collection that's generated by real family historians from around the world. Uh, in, in the academic context, it, it, it does raise uh, an interesting histori historiographical question or a, uh, a, a question of you know, whether such a, a collection would be of use to, to an academic scholar. And on one hand, there are cases in which you know, someone may decide that they don't want to use something that a person put into their personal family tree as a historical resource. Um, but I will also say that in these family trees, there is a lot of uh, collateral information uploaded, for instance, in uh, scanned photos and scanned documents. Uh, so you can see here, for instance, there's, there's several photographs of different people. So if you happen to be looking at uh, the history of a certain town and there's a prominent family in the town, you may be able to find a, a picture of, those, of that family, uh, which would definitely um, be something that you could use in, in a historical uh, analysis. Um, and you can also see that in these trees, people, both not, genealogists in many cases are no less stringent about their uh, citation and um, documentation of their sources as uh, academic scholars are. So in this case, um, there's a lot of, again, collateral information that these people are putting up uh, on, on the, the profiles of different individuals in the family tree to show where do they get that information. Uh, here, for instance, you have the, I'm oh, sorry, the some kind of military number, ID number of this person, things like that um, that do help uh, kind of place these family trees in a historical context. Uh, in terms of some general information about the, the historical records that we have, I mentioned the full U.S. Census, including images, which has over uh, half a billion names in it from 1790 to 1940. Um, and that is a really good collection. There, there is the, the U.S. Census is available on certain websites. Uh, you may ask whether it's available for free elsewhere. Um, it is partially available on certain other websites, but some may offer just the index. Some may offer a partial image set. But actually, in terms of a full, full coverage of the U.S. Census, including both the images and the index, that actually is not available. Uh, on any free resource. Um, so it is actually a good resource to be able to offer 
patrons looking into American history, you know, without any any worry that you may be missing a certain time period or region. Uh, U.S. Public Records Index is a collection of uh, U.S. public records from mostly the 20th century. Um, the Social Security Death Index, as well, does contain a lot of interesting information about uh, people from the United States throughout uh, mostly the 20th century. Um, uh, California Births and Deaths is an example of a, a local collection uh, which has 70 million records. Uh, U.S. World War II Army enlistment. U.S. Civil War soldiers, which includes both soldiers from the Union and the Confederate Army, um, as well as a lot of uh, interesting state and local uh, vital records collections, such as the, the death certificates that I showed you before. Um, and there's many other types of records, such as cemetery records, uh, city directories, and other new collections which are being added all the time. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, types of information that can be found in the U.S. Census, but I'll just show uh, from an academic perspective, there is a lot of interesting information to be found. Uh, for instance, you have the name, of course, and the family relations, but uh, there is information such as uh, race, um, place of birth of this person, as well as their parents, which exists in some censuses, not in all of them. Um, as well as uh, occupation, so you can look at different uh, elements of labor history, uh, immigration, as well as uh, there's also in a lot of the censuses there's information about personal wealth, uh, landed wealth, and you know these are these are topics that are of interest to scholars both in area studies, uh, also ethnic studies, as well as general histor historians. Uh, this is a, an example of our Civil War soldiers uh, record. This is a Union soldier showing some information such as uh, their rank, what unit they were in. Um, this is an example of a uh, digitized cemetery record, um, which, which contains a lot of information about the person, where they came from, uh, certain anthropological details about can be found on the actual, if you look at the gravestone, um, how were people being buried at a certain time period, what was important to place on the grave, what was not important. Um, there's really, again, uh, a lot of information you can find just by looking at it in, in different, from different directions. Uh, this is a city directory from Iowa, and again, um, you can see some information, for instance, you know, history of advertising, uh, what was being advertised, how were things being advertised, what, you know, what was the decision to put this particular piece on the left like that, that isn't something that we might be used to today. So how, how would that, um, what is the meaning of, of, of those kinds of choices? As well as here, uh, these listings containing uh, information about people's occupations or addresses. And this is a, an example of one of many uh, digitized books that we have. This is a genealogy book, but we have many different types of books in the collection. And um, here, this is also, this is interesting not only in terms of the information that is uh, that's documented in the book about this specific family, where they came from, what their descendants did, uh, but it also does can talk about certain uh, historiographical uh, topics and you know how why were people writing these books at that time? This is around uh, 1900. This was written, um, and what was important to them to note in these types of books. In terms of uh, global historical records, for people looking at uh, area studies from beyond the United States ethnic studies of either immigrants to the United States or in other countries. Uh, there is a lot of information to be found in, uh, for instance, the full, uh, England and Wales census from 1841 to 1901. Um, that is a collection that has very similar information to the United States census. So you can see where was someone born, their occupation, how, what was their living standard like, uh, things like that as well as many other United Kingdom records. So people doing uh, research on British history can find a lot of information there. 
German vital records, over 100, about 150 million records, um, as well as Scandinavian records. So if there's uh, anyone that has a Scandinavian studies department um, or people learning these languages even, uh, there is a lot of interesting information to be found in, in those records. Um, there's also census records from a variety of other countries, other European collections, uh, such as church books um, and other types of uh, interesting uh, documents, as well as uh, collections from other re regions in the world. Uh, this is the collection that I personally find to be very interesting. Uh, it's the uh, immigration cards from uh, early 20th century Rio de Janeiro. So if someone is looking at the history of Brazil, immigration history in Brazil, migration between uh, Europe or other parts of the world and South America during the early 20th century, this actually has a lot of information about these people who came, uh, including an original photograph, their original signature, um, and a lot of information here about where they were born, uh, what, what their birth date was, their nationality, their marital status, um, what they did uh, for work, and exactly when they entered Brazil. Uh, so that's a really nice record collection that has a lot of different applicability to, to different uh, historical fields. This is, again, uh, the Swedish household examination book, so people doing area studies in Sweden or uh, interested in uh, perhaps uh, politics in Sweden during the late 19th, early 20th centuries, anything like that, may find some interesting information here. Uh, this is a, an original uh, book documenting birth in the region of Leiden in the Netherlands. And this, you can see, is an original book recorded in 1620 with information about the, the people uh, that were born in, in the area. And you can see that this is written actually in French, so it might be of interest to someone trying to look at what was the, um, perhaps the influence of French in other parts of Europe during a certain time period, um, and how, how did that uh, interact with local uh, communities, local cultures. Uh, this is the Norway census from 1875, including a lot of interesting information about Again, occupation, uh, similar things to what um, are contained in the United States Census. Uh, this is a, a, a really interesting collection of uh, a news, an original newspaper from 1850. And it actually, this is a newspaper that was uh, begun in the early, mid-1800s and is still being published today. And we have the uh, full image uh, set with index from uh, that pretty much that entire time period. And it's just a really interesting uh, historical piece to be able to, because this, it wasn't just a documentation of names and dates of people in the Jewish community in the United, in the United Kingdom. You can see here that these are very uh, long composed articles about different topics. There's someone looking at the history of um, British reactions to communism, uh, art history. It's really amazing the types of things you can find in this uh, collection. So uh, it's, it's really not, it's not just a, a collection about Jewish history or Jewish uh, ethnic studies. It's really something that has applicability to a lot of different uh, fields. Uh, Germany, uh, birth and baptisms. Again, this is interesting because you can look at, for instance, uh, Catholic communities in Germany um, during a certain time period. Later, the directory of Ireland in Ireland. Uh, this is a street register from Dublin. Similar information to what was actually contained in the in the Iowa uh, directory. Uh, and then I'll also just touch briefly on family tree collections. Uh, just to see what 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 is there and what interesting uh, topics it brings up for historical scholars. Uh, so there there are 2.5 billion family tree records on the, available through the MyHeritage Library edition, uh, most of which are actually built by uh, real users of 
my heritage, uh, the consumer product of my heritage. Um, and these not only contain often well documented connections between relatives and families, but they also often contain collateral information such as photographs, scanned documents, and stories. Um, this is the family tree result page with many different photos and uh, a lot of information about this family, uh, again, generated by a real family member. And by going in and looking at uh, the tree, you can actually see, for instance, here that there's a variety of different photos attached to this profile of a person that lived in the late 19th century. Um, so these are also early photographs, and they may have been quite rare. So some looking at the history of this uh, area of, of Australia, they may, be, they may find this interesting, this uh, family story, how does it connect to a larger historical context. Um, so, because it may be, may be difficult to look at this and say, okay, how am I going to actually create an academic uh, argument based on some information that I'm finding in this, uh, in this database, um, I'm going to take you through a few tips that you can use for topical searches with, where you don't have to be looking for a specific person in order to find some information about uh, a certain historical or other uh, topic that you're looking at. So the first thing is that uh, to take advantage of the different search fields that we have, uh, which include name, birth, and death date, place, and keyword. Uh, so doing a search, you don't actually need to put a name in, even though it looks like it's the first search uh, item. So you need to put a name in. You actually don't need to put a name in. And um, if you're doing, for instance, an ethnic analysis, uh, analysis of a certain ethnic group in a certain area, uh, you can, first of all, go to a specific uh, collection, such as a local death uh, certificate collection or even the United States Census, and say, OK, I'm going to try to find some people from this community that I'm looking at by uh, perhaps using a common first and last name uh, from that community. So, um, for instance, if you're looking for uh, information about Turkish Jews that had immigrated to the United States in the early 20th century, you could look at the 1920 U.S. Census and put in a kind of general uh, Jewish name of someone you know that you are that you know is uh, used in the community that you're looking at, as well as uh, the birthplace of Turkey. And then you get some interesting results uh, from a variety of different locations around the United States. And then by going in and looking at one, uh, you can access perhaps maybe a city block or a building, an apartment building that had a lot of people from that ethnic background in, in um, living together in the United States and look at some of the information about what were their family structures like, what were uh, they doing for their work here it says kimonos for instance for this uh, Turkish there's a couple of people here who were somehow uh, working in the kimono industry or whatever that may have been in the low in the uh, contemporary time period what they might have understood that as um, as well as you know how, how do, are these people coming and living all together or are they um, integrating with other ethnic groups cultural history of immigration, things like that. Uh, doing a topical search from birth and death date, as I showed in the in the uh, in in the demo, for instance, by looking at a death record of someone who lived a relatively short life compared to whatever the life expectancy would have been, might show um, more information about people who were affected by certain uh, illnesses that were very uh, strong in a certain time period, whether it's influenza, tuberculosis, or other types of uh, illness. And then another thing you can do if you're looking at early Irish immigrants to the United States, and if we know that most uh, a large boom of Irish immigrants happened in uh, 1840s, 1850s, if we look before that time period 
and that's the time period we're interested in, we can find information about the people uh, that comprise the group that we're looking at. Uh, so this is an example of how you can use simple birth and death dates to find uh, some general information about uh, people who may have lived short lives. And then again, showing tuberculosis, where they contracted it, all this interesting information uh, that is contained in these uh, historical documents. Uh, if you look at a place, for instance, if you look at the United States Census and you're you're looking at a certain town, um, you're doing a kind of a local history of a certain town, um, you can find a lot of inf information about how that town changed over the years if you're looking at the time period after United, at the American Revolution. Um, you can find a lot of information about those kinds of historical trends just by looking at who was living in the town who moved in, who moved out, uh, what was happening, uh, in what were the occupations, things like that. So, for instance, this is a uh, census record from 1870 of a town called Mashpee, Massachusetts, which is a small majority Native American town. Um, and so if you're doing a ethnic studies uh, analysis of, of this Native American tribe, or interested in perhaps the fishing industry in uh, the late 19th century, you can find some great information uh, from this specific, uh, that type of search. Uh, in terms of citations and saving information, um, there, so the My Heritage Library Edition doesn't, there isn't a button or a certain way within the, within the database to actually export a citation. But all the results and all of the images have uh, unique links associated with them. So if people, people can take uh, that link, which is accessible later on, just like any uh, e-resource link that they would have for other, from other uh, databases that they're working with. Uh, so they can copy the link and create a citation based on that, uh, including the information on the, on the page. Um, and if they want to use the images uh, in their, their scholarly work, they can save them onto their computer and then uh, upload them into whatever uh, document they'd like. Uh, My Heritage Library Edition is offered with uh, remote access, including the entire database. And uh, you probably can tell me better that, uh, that uh, this is really an, an incredibly useful tool for researchers because it enables people to do, to access all this information from anywhere they are. They don't have to physically be in the library. So if I see a certain document that I like, um, I take it down, I take press, for, I document the link, I can always go back to it and look again no matter where I am. Uh, so what makes my heritage stand out? Uh, we have a lot of great unique content um, and remote access for the entire database. And in terms of the content that we have, uh, there's a lot of strength in our international content as well as uh, deep U.S. coverage. So people doing research both about United States topics, ethnic studies in the United States, um, or different regional topics within the United States can find a lot of great information, as well as people looking at uh, different uh, histories and area studies from outside the United States. And this is also nice because there's a lot of the, a lot of these types of record collections are things that you can't often find digitized online in their original image form. So if I was doing uh, studying Swedish history, um, the fact that there's all these literally millions of uh, documentary images searchable and viewable on the internet. Uh, you know, it can save me perhaps even a trip to Sweden to look in the local archives because uh, it's all made available for me right there. So um, this really is a very valuable resource uh, for people in a variety of fields. Um, so yeah, and with that, uh, Again, I'll just say uh, international and U.S. record collections, remote access, 
the full U.S. Census, and again, this is a very dynamic content collection with new records being added all the time. Right now, we have about six billion historical records in the database, and we're at we've added already in 2015 uh, one billion records. So really, it's it's quite a dynamic collection, and uh, I think your uh, your patrons will find a lot of interesting information by uh, using this database. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for questions now. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, see if uh, anyone has asked us anything. Hey Ross, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, we've actually gotten a few good questions in here. Let's see, I think we can. Uh, we still have about 10, 15 minutes. Want to respect everybody's time, so I think we can squeeze most of these in. Uh, but if anybody has any other questions that they think of, feel free to shoot them over at this point and uh, see if we can't still squeeze them in. Uh, but anyway, I'll jump into the first couple that came here. Uh, let's see. One question that came up was if you can search by community and more specifically, could somebody pull up, for example, could they pull up and review all the death certificates for a given municipality in a particular state like Arizona or so forth? Uh, yeah, sure. So if you're interested in, I'll go back to the Arizona example. So if you're interested in people who uh, died in you know, the early 20th century in Maricopa, Arizona. This will this will it will, this will give you a, a, a wide sample of those. Um, it's if you're interested in um, in a larger uh, kind of selection, you can eliminate the date. Uh, so yeah, you can definitely you know, or the search by by lo like locality. Okay, that's great. Um, and actually, on a, on a related note, actually this one just popped up, but it's, it's somewhat related to that question, is how how could one find out how much information is available from a particular state? Is that is that possible to access? Yeah. Um, so if you, so we offer the, the uh, My Heritage Library just, we offer a free trial we usually do a three-month free trial, uh, so anyone who's interested uh, can contact their EBSCO representative about that. And when you get it, one of the things that you can do to look at um, how this would be interesting for your for your patrons is to go in, for instance, if I want to know, I'll go back to Texas as an example. Um, on the right here, there is a listing of all the collections that we offer in Texas that are specific Texas collections. And then you just have to keep in mind that there are certain other documentary collections such as the United States Census, uh, Civil War records, um, and uh, Social Security death index, things like that, that are also, of course, relevant for people in Texas, uh, for, you know, Texas historical research. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of a mix of these specific Texas collections as well as larger United States collections, which also, of course, cover Texas. Great. That's fantastic. Um, while we're looking at the sort of the, <clears throat> the search interface and so forth, a uh, question about narrowing a search, as in can you, once you've gotten your initial results, can you search sort of again within the result list to, to further refine your search? Yeah, sure. So say I start with um, But if, for instance, if I put a specific person in, I'm looking for people in Arizona named James, John, James Johnson, um, and I say, okay, I see that there's a family tree thing here, there's a birth uh, record here. If I don't, if I want to say filter out the family trees, I can go over here and say, okay, I want to just look at the birth, marriage, and death records. And that'll take out all the uh, all the other types of record collections. So you may want to do this once and look at the uh, the birth and death records, or if you say, okay, I actually think I I, I could find some better information from the uh, sorry, from the uh, U.S. Census, then you go and uh, you just have to go and switch the collection to uh, United States Census. Sorry, got mixed up here. 
Okay, great, great. Yeah. Um, here's my. I think you actually might have mentioned this quickly, but just to just to be just to be clear, though, um, somebody wanting to ask about: Do we have any Canadian records? Yeah, sure. So if you want to find the, the Canadian records that we have, uh, this would be the listing of the Canadian collections that we have. And as well, we have the family trees, which uh, we do have a lot of people in Canada that are building family trees. Um, so that's also useful for people. Okay. Um, and actually, I think you mentioned, too, that one of the strengths of the product in, in general is its strong international coverage um, going beyond North America. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, uh, back to the census information real quick. There's a question here about the source of the census indexes, wanting to know if MyHeritage uh, indexes them yourselves or if they're the indexes of the censuses are taken from another source. Um, we did I – don't, I don't want to give a specific answer to that because I don't have that information off the top of my head, um, but I believe it is different. It's a different – um, I, I, you know, I, I'll uh, see if I can find an answer to that, and maybe we can send that out. Because I don't, I don't exactly know where it came from, and I don't want to give any misinformation. No, oh, that's fair enough. We we can respond back um, directly with with that. That's it's a good question. I I'd, I'd like to know myself. Um, on that same note, there was another question that's related to I think the census data. Wanting to know if uh, information such as when you get your results in, from a you know, census data and so forth is, can that be exported to a CSV or other spreadsheet type of format to be able to further conduct your research in that manner? Uh, so the census information it can't be exported specifically to a CSV, but uh, when you look at a census record. Um, Try to just pull it up quickly here. Uh, if you're look when you're looking at a, a household, uh, there is all the information about the household is uh, extracted and put in uh, text print on, on the page, so you can pretty easily uh, copy-paste that into a, in, into a CSV, but in terms of the actual uh, image here, that we can't, you can't do that using the, uh, using the database. Okay, thank, thanks for clarifying that. That helps. Um, on a similar note, actually, I think this is a very, I think it's a very different question, but um, can the citation Citations and, result, and other results be imported into RefWorks, like other content that we offer through EBSCOhost. Uh, so I think when folks want to be able to cite their resources. Yeah, so as I said before, there is, an, there is not an export citation button or uh, tool within, within the product, but all of, for instance, if you look at this record, this is the link to it is a, uh, is a unique link. So you can take the link and it, it would be a manual import, um, but it is it is possible you can cite it that way. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, let's see here. Going back, going, moving on to sort of the obviously as as we expected, a few questions here comparing um, comparing my heritage to other competitive products, and one in particular wanting to know about if. Um, how the metadata in MyHeritage would compare to, say, other free public sources or other genealogy databases? Is there a significant advantage to the metadata that's provided? Um, I, I would just say if, if you're talking about, um, for instance, the search that someone does, it makes it much easier. The product is built to, to be very easy to use for someone looking for information about a specific person. So there is, uh, you can see there is a lot of data attached to, um, to each record, which enables you to search, um, to be able to go through a list of results and say, okay, you know, this is not what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. Um, so in that sense, there is we do have pretty strong metadata in that sense. Um, so 
I, I don't have a specific comparison to other products, but we do make a very strong effort to put that kind of information um, out in front of uh, the viewer to make it easier for them to navigate the, the product. Would this be a good place to talk briefly about um, the MyHeritage's ability to search for similar names, uh, spellings, and so forth, that where it makes it a little bit easier to track down the, the, the data you're looking for, even if you don't have exact information? Yeah, so um, if I'm looking for maybe someone who uh, immigrated from uh, Sweden to the United States, and I, I think that they might have spelled their name one way, um, but I don't, I didn't know, um, I, I don't know exactly whether they were spelling their name one way or the other at a certain time period. Um, when I do a search for something like Wendy Peterson, I'll get results both for Peterson with two S's as well as Peterson with one S, um, just because that's, uh, you know, because the system knows that people may have changed names during uh, their lives or, uh, you know, it, 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 it does allow for some uh, flexibility in terms of the results that it gives based on that. And we also do, for instance, if you put in a name in Russian um, and there's someone who, for instance, if they moved to the United States and they were known as Alexander in Russia and then that was written in Cyrillic characters, but they changed their name to Alexander written in English when they got to the United States, we'd actually be able to cover both the American version, the United, the English version, and the uh, Russian version of that name. So that's actually, that's really interesting as well. Great, great, thank you, Ross. Uh, let's see here, let's see what time. We have a few more minutes here. Um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, da, da, da. It's actually one more specifically tied to the, the family tree side of it. If somebody wanted to check on a family tree and start with themselves, um, do they have to make the connections between family members or are those connections made automatically for them by the software? Um, sorry, can you re I didn't hear that. Can you repeat sorry, sure. repeat the question? Uh, they want to, if they check on a, want to check on a family tree and start with themselves, do they have to make the connections between family members or will the connections be made already? Um, if you're looking for information about your own family history, so this product doesn't, does not enable someone to build a family tree in, in, in the product. That's something that we do on the consumer product, not on the institutional product, the library edition. Um, if you're looking for uh, how you personally connect to a family tree, um, what I would suggest is, would be to take uh, some of the names of your relatives and just try to search for them in the My Heritage Family Trees collection with as many as much information as you know about them. And hopefully uh, you'll find a hit to to a certain family tree and that'll that'll start helping you fill in some of that information. Okay. Fantastic. Um I had a couple other questions here that are very, very specific particular and specific, uh, I think it'd be best if we follow up with those folks directly. Um, so other than I think we've pretty much covered everything that we had here. Um, wanna, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending our session today. Uh, at the close of the session, you will have the option to respond to a very brief survey about today's presentation. We do appreciate all your feedback as it does help us to plan future sessions that can best meet your professional needs. Uh, you will also receive an email from us within the next few days with the link to the recording of today's session along with some additional contact information should you have further questions or comments. Uh, so I want to thank you again for joining us and have a great day, everyone, and thank you, Ross. Thanks a lot, everyone.